what's the worst that can happen? All that I know is we'll get older. So that us stands this side of the way. New year, new pre-authorization problems. For those of you that are new here, my name is Barrett Laurie and I'm a crony. And this vlog series, Crohn's Unfiltered, is all about my life as I work my way through my disability and figure out career, life, family, thriving, in spite of that disability. Today I'm going to be doing a deep dive into talking about something that I've talked about over the years because it's something that happens at the beginning of every year. And for those of you that don't suffer from a chronic illness, first of all, congratulations. I'm very, very happy for you. <laughs> for those of us that do, the beginning of the year is not only New Year, New Us, it's also a time to fight with our insurance companies. And what am I talking about? I'm talking about pre-authorization. And what's mind-numbingly frustrating about pre-authorization is we're not pre-authorizing a new drug. In my case, actually, we're pre-authorizing the same drug I've been on every year with the exception of 2021. The same drug I've been on for years. The same drug that has kept me healthy and well. The same drug that has allowed me to live a semi-normal life with the exception of the occasional setback, which is just par for the course if you suffer from chronic illness and more specifically IBD Crohn's. Pre-authorization. What is it? Every year in January, if you are on a regular medication treatment plan that requires authorization from your insurance company before you receive the medication, so for example, Remicade infusions. Remicade, for those of you that don't know, is a life-saving drug that's medical name is infliximab. It is the only FDA-approved drug on the market to treat Crohn's disease, and more specifically, complex paraanal Crohn's disease, which is the kind I have. My Crohn's presents in the form of anal fistulas, which are little tunnels that tract from your intestine down to a point near or around your anus and leak basically a fluid of infection, a pus, more or less. It's painful. It's awful. Trust and believe you don't want it. Therefore, the goal is always trying to avoid anything that might cause an anal fistula to come back. This is just, this kind of makes good sense, right? For the last two years, pre-authorization has meant for me some pretty major health setbacks because in 2022, I had absolutely no treatment in January, meaning the entire month of January, my doctor was fighting my insurance company for the same medicine they had been giving me the previous year. They were just fighting them to authorize it for a new year. Same drug, same dosage, same medium of delivery, which is infusion. And again, in 2022, I went the entire month of January without treatment. When I miss a day or even a week, my body normally can accept that. It's okay. It doesn't throw me into a flare. It doesn't create really wild symptoms that risk my health. But in 2022, towards the third week of January, about this time, actually, I landed in the hospital with diverticulitis. Diverticulitis was the autoimmune response that my body had to the delay in care. I was given some antibiotics. I was, I made some dietary changes for a number of weeks and I suffered through some uncomfortable pain and some loose bowel stool situation for a couple of weeks because antibiotics have that effect on me. If I'm taking an antibiotic, you can guarantee I'm gonna have some of the diarrhea. I had trouble walking up and down stairs. I had trouble sitting for extended periods of time, but overall, fairly mild response. This year, the pre-authorization fight automatically out of the gate resulted in a denial, which was unusual from last year. I didn't get a denial, I got a hold, which they held for almost four weeks, and then the first week of February was finally infused. The very first week of January, I want to say the 4th, 3rd or 4th, I got immediately a letter in the mail that was a denial. Just flat out, we deny this, we're not doing Remicade. So I contact my doctor's office. My doctor is used to taking the lead on this type of situation with my insurance company. Meaning, my doctor's office, the nurses in my doctor's office, actually do all of the front-facing appeals and fights with my insurance company. I am actually very lucky in that I don't have to run that ball down the field for myself. I recognize that is not the case with all GI doctors and for all IBD patients or a, a wider explanation. 
for all folks with chronic illness. I understand that sometimes the patient has to take that onus on themselves. In the past, I have had to write some letters, gather some information from specialists to turn into my doctor to submit on my behalf. But again, all of this appeals process is something that you, the patient, have the right to do yourself, should you choose. In my case, my doctor does it for me because so far he's always been successful as long as I don't speak to the insurance company, which sounds a little backwards. But the reason for that is this. In the past, when my insurance company would reach out to me when I was going through an appeal process with the denials, they get you on a recorded line, they ask you questions about your diet, your environment, basically anything they can gather information on and essentially use as an excuse to deny your coverage. So essentially, my doctor's office takes the position, do not speak to the insurance company, say nothing to them, including when they call you and say, oh, I'm an RN and I'm here to help you and I wanna talk through your diet and things you can do to improve your treatment plan, lies. Lies, lies, lies. That is not what they are doing. They are looking for any excuse in the world to not pay your claim. I don't talk to them, my doctor does. So this year I get the denial. I didn't think much of it. I thought, okay, well, this might be a week or so. What's the worst that can happen? <laughs> Shingles. Shingles was the worst that could happen. That, 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 is, that is what happened. <laughs> On Thursday, January the 11th, I found myself in the emergency room with excruciating pain from a rash, a rash that I'm gonna show you a picture of now that basically overnight took over my body. For two nights, I'd been taking Benadryl to kind of take care of this, the itchiness that I was experiencing, but I wasn't experiencing pain. But one odd sensation was a kind of tingling feeling on this side of my body, the rash over here and down my back. It, it was tingly, kind of like uh, if your leg were to fall asleep and it's waking back up that feeling you have of like little fingers sort of tinglies and then like screaming pain, right? And, and the first few days, the pain was like a three or a four. I wake up Thursday morning in the middle of the night with really bad diarrhea. I mean, like really bad for me and blood in stool, which is always a whoop, red flag, something's going on in my digestive tract. Not only that, my entire body, my arms, my, my entire trunk, um, my back, my, my chest, my, my stomach, my, my arms, parts of my neck, I had this rash that was popping up and, and, and like flaming red, right? And they sort of looked like little pimples, kind of like, in bunches. So Thursday, I had a really important meeting at work, forced on some clothes, which literally y'all, I'm crying. I'm like putting on a cotton t-shirt and a button down shirt because it was frigid cold and a very light kind of sweater over it, screaming pain, excruciating pain. I had to go to this two hour meeting on campus with the big wigs in my department and HR and the Dean's office. We were going over some important stuff. I could not miss the meeting. I recognized right away, oh my gosh, I don't think I can stand to wear clothes for more than a couple of hours at a time. I had set up a virtual visit with my GI doctor's office for them to kind of look at this rash and tell me what was going on and why in the world it was burning my skin off. Oh, and I was going to mention the diarrhea and the other stuff because again, my GI's office, right before it began, they called me like the people were saying their hellos. It was right before we began the meeting. I stepped out and they said, you know what? I want you to go physically see someone. So go straight to urgent care whenever you're done with your meeting. Suffer through the meeting, finish up, head straight to urgent care. My beautiful husband was off work. He and, and Briley girl picked me up, took me. Thankfully, I was kind of feeling good enough that I was like, okay, let's let's go see what's what's going on here. So I go in, I sit down. The nurse practitioner comes in and says, do you mind showing me the rash? And I'm like, meh, no problem. So I'd already kind of stripped down to my t-shirt. I, I stand up and I go to like lift my t-shirt up. My husband's helping me because I'm, I'm literally having trouble just even brushing up against these spots in my body was like, oh lift my shirt up. This is no joke, you guys. The man goes, huh? literally gasps, audible gasp. And he says, this might be the worst case of shingles I've ever seen. And I'm like, come again, shingles? Like, pump the brakes. How do I have shingles? I'm, I'm 41 years old. I, I had chicken pox twice, but I've asked for the shingles vaccine and they've told me 
I'm too young. Like I can't, I can't have it yet. Well, how could I possibly have shingles? And he's like, well, I don't know, but you got it. So as I'm turning around, he goes, whoa, whoa, whoa. You have two spots on your face. And one of them is right by your eye. I said, yeah, no, very observant way to go. He goes, you need to go straight to the emergency room. Uh, okay. So why? Well, he's like, has your eye been itching? Now I'm wearing contacts at this point, right? He goes, has your eye been itching? Yes. As a matter of fact, it has for a couple of weeks now, actually. The spot around my eye has been really itchy. And I just assumed it was, you know, uh, some sort of odd dry skin. It's cold weather. Like, you know what I mean? It's, I didn't think much of it. He's like, it could be shingles. If it's in your eye, you can have blindness. Huh? <laughs> what? 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 When he recommended I go straight to the emergency room, do not pass go, I did actually not go straight to the emergency room. I went home and changed clothes into much looser fitting cotton clothes just so I could be more comfortable. We shoot over to the emergency room. We got in surprisingly fast. Right away, a very same experience. I go in, I take off my t-shirt for the physician's assistant and the attending because I'm at the University of Missouri emergency room. So again, it's, it's attendings come in before the actual doctor. So the PA and the attending physician are both in there. And again, the moment the shirt comes off, audible gasps. <laughs> and, oh, I forgot to tell you, the nurse practitioner took my picture. He's like, can I take a picture of this? Sure, why not? I, I already feel like a circus freak. Why not take a snapshot for posterity? Of course, why wouldn't you? I get to the emergency room and very same thing. They're like, whoa, 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 whoa. We're gonna take some photos. The good news was they were taking photos for my file. And they of course showed me the camera and see this is going into your medical file. So but at least it's a teaching hospital. Like this is a teachable moment. I can understand why they would want people to see what this is. Sitting there, excruciating pain. I literally took my shirt off, rolled my like sweatpants down pretty low just to wear any of the rash was exposed. I was just, I, I had to sit topless and, and could not lay on the bed. They were like, lay down, forget yourself. I can't, no, absolutely not. What crazy world are you living in? I'm sitting upright. They get the IV on the first try, which is amazing and, and, a, and a freaking miracle because I was so dehydrated at that point. But I had an amazing nurse at MU Healthcare uh, ER that got me on the first try. She was so patient. I'm sitting there waiting for the dermatologist to come in. The dermatologist comes in. He happened to be walking by and was like, I heard this case of like a really horrible case of shingles and your age and, and you have Crohn's disease. And so I'm kind of, I was, you know, sort of at a loss for what's going on. So he walks in and looks me over and he's like, well, it's wild because the pain and the tingling sensation that you're talking about, it really sounds like shingles. And, and this one side of your body looks like shingles. Like that's what this looks like in some of the spot on your face. He's like, now on the other side of your body though, that doesn't look like shingles. That looks like eczema, like a really, really bad flare of eczema. Do you have eczema? No, I don't have eczema. Have you been tested for eczema? Yes, multiple times. And no, I've never had eczema. I don't have any allergic skin allergies. I've been tested for that multiple times. You know, he was like, I, I don't know which it is. Maybe it's both. We don't know. And I'm like, what do you mean you don't know? Like, is there, is there not a test? Like, do we not have like a scrape some skin on a, like a little clear thing and like house comes in and, and you guys talk about this. He's like, stay calm. Love when they say that. Sure, my, I, I feel like my skin is burning off. Absolutely, I'll stay completely calm. We've mentioned blindness today. I've had multiple medical professionals gasp at the sight of me, which, you know, I, the gasp for me was it. And then the pictures, right? And then the like, let's take a picture of you. Those are always a bad sign, but Go ahead and tell me in the comments below about your worst experience with a doctor in their bedside manner. The attending comes back in, the dermatologist comes back in, and ultimately they decide we're just not sure. The pain you're describing, 100% shingles, right? The rash on this side of your body looks like shingles. The rash on this side of your body looks more like eczema, but it's not scaly. It's not uh, the way eczema would normally look. However, your immune system is at an all-time low. You take a huge amount of immunosuppressants, every single, a chemo pill, every single day that drops your immune system to like zilch. 
So if you were to have a, a crazy eczema outbreak, it might look like this. But same goes for the shingles. And the eczema outbreak shouldn't cause the tingling, burning pain that you're experiencing. However, I couldn't at that point because the pain was so bad. Like we're talking a nine on a scale of out of 10. And I have dealt with some pain. Like anal fistula is pain like a, a 15 on a scale of 10 is what that feels like. I know how to deal with pain. So when I say a nine, y'all, I mean a nine. Ultimately, they sent me home with antivirals to treat the shingles and to like knock it out and make sure that whatever was going on with my eye didn't travel to my eye and that would be a problem. We set up an appointment with my ophthalmologist for the following Monday. Basically, they said, we wanna see you next week when you've had these antivirals in you for about five or six days and kind of look at everything and see where it's at. She's like, I'm also gonna prescribe for you an antibiotic in case it happens to be eczema and you've been itching and it's now become infected, right? So we wanna treat that as well. So we're gonna throw an antibiotic at you. And I'm like, whoa, haven't had my infusion, already have inflaming diarrhea throw an antibiotic in there and I'm basically a Sally Poops doll where whatever goes in is coming right out. You know, are we sure about this? Yes, we're sure. Great. Awesome. Then they prescribed two steroids, topicals, to go on to kind of get the rash and everything under control. God bless my husband. That man lathered me up in that steroid cream crying just every time he touched me to put it on my body I'm, I'm bawling i'm screaming i'm cursing I, I mean literally this is a man who i wasn't feeling well enough to take care of our dog so not only is he cleaning out miss briley's folds once a day he's coming into the bathroom to treat mine he deserves a medal if anyone's out there nominating people for nobel peace prize think about ricky because he's seen some things okay get on the medicine and things start feeling better thankfully this whole rash has settled down since I'm now experiencing tingly pain just on the one side of my body, we're kind of of the impression I did have the double whammy, shingles, eczema. You kind of look at your insurance company and you're like, was this worth it? Like, is the denial worth the hospital visit? I don't know how much the infusion might have been, but was what you guys are gonna have to pay in my ER and all these specialist visits, like, was it worth it? I don't know. I, you know, I guess so. I guess that, I guess that's their like risk reward analysis. I don't, I don't have any idea. Why put people through a situation every single year where this happens? We won't do this again, right? Because here's what my GI and I decided. When I finally did get my infusion at the beginning of February, it set up all of my infusions at the beginning of a month no more what we're doing now is he's appealed again the denial they denied a home visit where they could come and give me the infusion because obviously the infusion center didn't want to take me in to do my infusion even if it was approved they didn't want to take me while i'm still on a cyclovir because anyone else that might be in the infusion center that also has an immune system that's down at about i don't know zero they would then be susceptible to catching either the chicken pox or shingles from me. Very unlikely, but possible. And I certainly don't want anyone else to go through this because this is awful. My doctor contacted me on Friday. He's very, very hopeful that the other appeal is going to be approved because essentially he's doing the same argument he did last year of, okay, you guys delayed this treatment. You act as if he can go every eight weeks, six weeks without an infusion because you guys don't wanna pay monthly because I am on a monthly infusion. Remicade is normally given every eight weeks. In terrible cases, it's given every six weeks. And the dosage is usually in the 600 to 800 milligram range. I get 1200 milligrams once a month. So it's a lot, right? It's a big dose monthly instead of every eight weeks. So instead of six infusions a year, it's 12. And they don't want to pay it, period, full stop. Anyone out there who says you love your insurance company, you're not having to use them. Trust and believe. My doctor says, I think we're in a good place to get approved for the upcoming Remicade infusion once you get off of your antivirals, you can go back in. I'm off of the antivirals the 23rd of January. Fingers crossed, they are going to go ahead and approve that pre-authorization and I'll be able to go ahead with my infusion as planned at the end of the month. And then I will continue to get that infusion at the end of the month so that next year, I'm not skipping a week or two 
during the pre-authorization that happens every single year. This is such a messed up system, it has to change, it's awful. What am I doing? I'm running out to the mailbox every single day, just waiting for that letter that tells me, yes, we're gonna quit being dirty assholes and give you the treatment you deserve and you need. I just want access to my medication. That's all any patient wants is access to our medication. When access is denied, it causes undue stress that then opens the body up to some sort of awful autoimmune reaction like, I don't know, shingles. <laughs> Here's the thing. I had a day where I felt sorry for myself and I laid around and I thought, woe is me, this is awful. I, you know, why me? Why can't it just be simple? Why can't I just get the medications that I need? Bottom line is that doesn't do me any good. That isn't going to make me feel any better. That isn't going to distract me from the pain. That isn't going to get me back to work. I mean, the other fear I had was how in the world am I going to go to work if I have to sit around topless all the time? It's not exactly like anybody isn't going to make a complaint about a man in his mid forties coming to work topless, right? I mean, that's like a no brainer. Thankfully, I am currently getting approved for an accommodation plan at work for my disability. And I have the most amazing bosses in the world, as well as incredibly supportive chairs of the departments that I oversee. So all of them were incredibly supportive and like, just work remote for a few weeks until you get your infusion and you're feeling better. Just, you can work from home. Your job is 100% doable from home. Work remotely. That has been a godsend. And not everybody has that opportunity, right? So all of these little blessings added up. I do have access to healthcare. Are they assholes? Sure, but I have it. I have an amazing, amazing doctor who fights for me. And I mean, goes to war for me every year, multiple times a year. Dr. Deepak, I cannot tell you how many people I go out into the world and say, you saved my life because you did, you have, and you've kept me healthy and well. And I am eternally grateful for that. And I also recognize that not everyone has that. And when my DMs are open to people from all over the world, I hear horror stories of people who are suffering from Crohn's disease, just like me, who don't even have access to the medication to get it under control. So I have to recognize that even in my lowest moments, when I'm feeling like, woe is me, how could this happen to me? Why me? I, I don't know why me. There isn't a great answer for that. And there never will be. But the bottom line is, I am a whole lot more blessed and lucky than a lot of people out there. So I need to check those feelings right away when they happen. And I work hard to do that. And I have an amazing husband who is so supportive and loving, an amazing family, my mother and my sister and my brother-in-law and, and, and their love and support to kind of keep me going and, and keep me positive and moving forwards. And crazy as it sounds, you guys, this experience reminded me why I started this channel in the first place. I didn't see much content about my experience with Crohn's, about anal fistulas. Now, sure, there are doctors talking about it. I don't want to hear from doctors about it. I want to hear from other people that are like me. That's what I didn't see on YouTube. I didn't see patients talking about their experiences with Remicade, with their GI doctors, with fighting their insurance companies. This experience reminded me why I'm here, who I'm here to serve, what the point of this was all about. I promised in the tease of my short earlier this week that I would share my experience so that maybe you could avoid the same fate I found. Let's talk about some of the things you can do. Number one, always remember that a denial from your insurance company is not final, okay? You are allowed an appeal. And if your doctor's office doesn't have the bandwidth or the staff to run that appeal for you, holy moly, go out and do it for yourself. Document everything. I write journals, daily journals, about my bathroom habits, my food log, and also pain levels and what's going on with my body, rashes, anything, headaches, any odd symptoms that could be attributed to my chronic illness. Put them in the journal. Keep a journal every single day. You will need it when it comes time to fight some sort of an appeal like this. Make sure you put date and time and just track what's going on with your body. When you have that information, you might use it to write the narrative for your appeal because there is always a narrative about what the result is due to their denial. They denied you. What is your body's response to that? How, how are you feeling and not mentally, although that's something, but physically, what happens to you when you don't get that medication or it's delayed? You need that. 
any labs that you have going back several months, get them together because you'll need those too. And then continue, uh, just be the squeaky wheel. You know, they, they deny you, appeal again. They deny you, appeal again. Just keep going over and over and over until it's a yes. Just be the squeaky wheel. Do not give up. If your doctor is not going to run the ball on your appeal for you, then be sure and get some documentation from them as well. Get something in writing that talks about why they're prescribing you this. Why so often? What testing have you had? CT scan, MRIs, uh, any blood work, labs, anything that can back up your claim that you need to override this appeal, have your doctor put that in writing. You can submit that on their behalf. All of that information together is what you're going to need to overcome that denial and get your appeal approved. For anyone out there that's struggling or going through this pre-authorization hell that I find myself in now, hang in there. It is temporary. It feels huge and insurmountable, but I assure you, it will pass. There is an incredible community of people here on YouTube that are disabled just like us, that are going through this or have gone through this and can give you their opinions, their experiences. I, I'm so heartened. I, I got on my comments here on YouTube and went to a video that I made three years ago about anal fistulas and noticed that there was a conversation between two people who both had anal fistulas and were having the CETON surgery done to rectify the situation. And they went back and forth over 30 comments with one another, supporting one another, giving their feedback. This is what I did. This is what I experienced. Here's my best practices. I didn't even see this conversation. It had completely missed me. But what happened? Complete strangers supported each other in the comments of a video just like this and backed one another up. And then what I loved at the end was the number of people that jumped in there and also gave their love and support. Get the support that you need from others because it's a scary thing. Not knowing whether or not you're going to get the treatment that you need and deserve, that's a scary thing, okay? It's, it's heavy. It's a lot. And for you, I don't want you to go through that alone. I hope you can lean on us for that. I'm going to go out to the mailbox. <laughs> and I'm going to see if my letter is there. I feel like I'm in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, just hoping I get my golden ticket. But I'm going to go look and see if it's there. Soon, I'm going to get the approval. And I will update you all soon that I did have the infusion. We'll follow up in the vlog next week about what happened with the dermatologist and where we're at with the shingles. So that if anyone out there finds themselves in an autoimmune response of shingles, maybe you can learn something from my experience that can help you have a less painful go of it. I'm not sure. It seems pretty awful across the board. <laughs> but if you find this content helpful, please like and subscribe, comment below. It's a community of people that are disabled in the Crohn's IBD community. We understand and we got you. No one better than us to understand what you're going through and just know that you're not alone and there's nothing to be ashamed of. It's an illness. Hang in there and know that this crony knows that you're gonna be okay. And if you do have an appeal, give them hell, honey. See you next week.